Hello, hello, hello again. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ala Ashimare. My pronouns are she and her. And welcome to the Day of Action, Racial Justice, um, Racial Justice, right? And we are here at our keynote program for today. Uh, the Day of Action was curated by the New Haven Pride Center in partnership with the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. Again, my name is Ala. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the youth program manager here at the New Haven Pride Center. Before we begin today's program, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are hosting this event. The New Haven Pride Center and the International Festival of Arts and Ideas were founded and operate on the traditional lands of the Mohegan, the Mashantucket Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, the Scaticote, the Golden Hill Pagasaw, the Wappinger, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac peoples. We hope that from wherever you are, you take a moment to acknowledge and honor the native people whose land you occupy and the history of the place you are in. Find out more about native lands and the native land that you are on at native-land.ca. Now I'm really, really excited to introduce you and welcome you to today's keynote uh, program. The Center's Day of Action was created as a mini conference and this is um, this year we are doing this in a one day mini conference and we are at the halfway mark y'all. Uh, before we begin, we would like to thank our sponsors who made today's program possible. Without the support of each one of these organizations like the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, CT Humanities and the City of New Haven Department of Arts, Culture and Tourism, we would not be able to bring you this exceptional conversation. So before we, uh, now let's begin our introduction, excuse me. And I want to introduce you Salwa. Um, their pronouns are they and them. And they, Salwa is a Connecticut born singer, songwriter, uh, artist, creator, curator, organizer, amazing, amazing human. And they are also a poet who sang background for Childish Gambino during his historical host and performance on Saturday Night Live to debut the This Is America and Saturday singles. They are an up and coming artist with soul and consciousness that uses their voice and flowetry to both uplift spirits and voices and all of us. Thank you so much for joining us, Sawa. Take it away. Yeah, it was everything for me. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu. Hello, peace be upon everybody in this piece. We end this and I'm so excited um, to be moderating this panel with uh, somebody so dear to me, somebody who's been trailblazing this piece, um, somebody who is a part of this Uma on period. And I'm just so excited um, to introduce Blair Imani. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the queen um, <laughs> before we get right into it. But Blair Imani is a critically acclaimed historian, author, educator, and influencer. Uh, New York Times praises Blair Imani's unique ability to create progressive lessons with vibrant visual and a perky kirky delivery. Her viral micro learning series, Smarter in Seconds, which I watch all the time, demonstrates her signature style of making abstract concepts more concrete in a well-researched and well-presented and concise manner. Uh, she is an author, <laughs> period, come on, writing books. Um, read this to get smarter about race, class, gender, disability, and more, which is coming out in 2021. Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration in the Black American Dream 2020, and the modern history stories um, of women and non-binary people, rewriting history in 2018. Her work centers women and girls, global black communities, and the LGBT community. As an educator and influencer, semi-retired organizer and public Speaker Blaine Roddy is dedicated to making the world a better place and amplifying the voices and work of those fighting the good fight. Sheesh! And that is something you're surely doing. Welcome, Blair Imadi. 
Shukran, thank you, girl. Oh my goodness. You know, it's so, um, it's such an honor to be in a space where, you know, we've met in person, you came to my book launch, um, and yes. to be in a space, uh, because I find that so often diversity centers whiteness and then creates this sense of otherness. And so to see us being in the same space together, I think is very important. I want to name that. I also want to thank the New Haven Pride Center for hosting us, for making space for this conversation. Um, and if at any point I look a little bit tired, that's because it's 10 p.m. here in London where I am. Um, and so, uh, you know, doing the work no matter what, um, mm -hmm. but also getting that, that rest as well. Um, not rest for the sake of being more productive, but rest for the sake of rest as we learn from the NAP ministry. So I'm very excited to get into the talk today. Yo, and it's all of that. And we also love the just coming into your fullness. Um, before we get this conversation started, I wanted to start it off with an ayah of Quran, which really I felt moved to like start it off with because I was like, yo, this feels super present and like relevant, which is what also. So it goes, Bismillah Rahman Rahim wa Asr inna insana na fin kusur inna nadina amanu wa amnu salihat wa tawasub al haki wa tawasub al sabr. And and the translation is, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, by the token of time, through the ages, verily man is in loss except such as have faith and do righteous deeds and join together in mutual teachings of truth and of patience and constancy and so much. I mean. So much of that spoke to me because I was like, listen, we got Blair Mind, who's a historian. We're coming into this speaking some real alignment. Um, and so I wanted to just like start it off with you um, being able to name yourself and then also talk about, yo, coming into yourself as a being in this world who does so much who's out here trailblazing as an author, as an activist, out here in the streets speaking truth, getting these ads on period, okay, billboards. Come on, can you talk about it? But also when I see all that, and I think of that, I also think about like, where did Blair Imani, when did, who did Blair Imani come out of? And like, what, where did that, where did that naming of self, like that rebirth and that intersectional awakening, um, where did that start? So I feel like there's a lot in there, but it's just like a oh, that's it. Thank you. I received that. I received the affirmations as well. Um, so actually, I named myself Blair Imani. Well, my mother named me Blair, and I chose the name Imani when I converted to Islam in 2015. Um, and it was one of those names that I had written down in my notes app where I was, I'm going to name one of my kids this. I don't have any kids yet, and I felt like it was too beautiful of a name for me to wait. Um, and so it means my faith. You know, faith uh, It's uh, comes from Iman. It's also a word in Swahili. Um, there's so many different variations, whether it's Amani or Aminata um, or you know my own Imani. It really suited me. Um, and I think that's really important. If we talk about naming of self, right? It doesn't have to be for a specific purpose. Sometimes people will change their name uh, or come into a name that better suits them uh, during a gender transition or a life event or marriage. But truly, the name that we have is often the only thing people know about us, so we better like it. And if we don't like it, I feel like it's important to change that because there's such an emphasis on uh, being static and mm -hmm. instead of being dynamic. And, and the fact is that we contain multitudes and we deserve to honor those multitudes and express ourselves because, you know, my former name, Blair Elizabeth, mm -hmm. didn't suit me. Uh, people did not receive me when they heard that name. Uh, I would also always get Mr. Blair because Blair's a gender neutral name, uh, as all names should be. But there is gender connotation to names. Uh, and so with Blair Imani, that really suited me and, and it fit like a, a puzzle piece. And sometimes we have to choose things for ourselves. Um, but I've been many different Blair Imanis in, in this past time of me coming into kind of a public sphere. Um, the one that my current truth, right, my current understanding of, of who I am is that of an educator. And I think previously I was trying to chase this um, dream of being something that I was expected to be by others. And things like coming out, things like stepping into my queerness publicly, stepping into Islam, growing through my 20s. You know, I'm 27 now, so I'm still doing that. Um, made me realize the things that I decide for myself and the things that others put onto me. And which of those do I need to participate in? Um, and I'm actually going to be doing a lesson on this quite soon, but we are who we are regardless of whether or not other people honor us in that way or understand us in that way or respect us in that way because who we are is immutable and it may change over time, but our truths will always be our truths, whether or not we are in a, a position of safety to share that with others. 
Um, and so that's what really marks me right now is um, being able to express myself and, and walk in this, you know, understanding of self and share that with uh, with a group of people that grows increasingly um, and doing that in really innovative ways, you know, like being a, you know, a former a retired grassroots organizer to now a historian to now stepping into this influencer space has been really interesting, especially as the dynamics in different industries start to change. I, I remember what it was like in 2014, where if you were trying to do social media work, I, I had people telling me I couldn't talk about social justice and also be an educator. And now it really feels as though that has switched. If you don't talk about social justice, then you can't be an influencer. Um, and so when we think about things like influence, it's not just to sell products, it's to educate, it's to really transform uh, and be a mirror to other people as well. So I'll start with that. And you started off with, there's so much, there's so much there. There's so much there and so much of our art um, and so many gems there. So thank you. I what was ringing for me and, and a question that came up for me was like, um, and so I did my research, okay? <laughs> I did my research. Um, and in a talk that you did um, with the Muslim uh, being, queer being on YouTube, um, you were talking about how your family has always been super supportive of you and your process, whether that be in your queerness or coming into Islam. And so I wanted to know, like, what was that? Probably, yeah, okay, okay, we can talk about that too, because that's important. <laughs> um, uh, and so my question was like, with that support, um, what did that support look like in terms of yourself? Like, how did you nurture yourself through a process of self-acceptance? And I feel like there's two coins to this. One, there was a process of like coming into the queerness and then also a process of like coming into Islam, which when I saw the two stories intersect was like this, act, there was this activism piece that came in this way and then and then rolled seamlessly into into the process of um getting connected to islam and, and and what that meant for you thank you yeah so the reason why i did a little bit of like eh, was because um so my parents have always been extremely queer affirming my mother has been queer affirming to the point of like a little bit intimidating um for example my older brother is also gay and i'm bisexual and my mom didn't know how to do queer affirming sex ed, but she was going to be damned if she didn't do, if she didn't make that available for her kids. So she took both of us to an internist who explained, you know, different type of like ways to have, you know, to do contraception, ways to do safe sex or safer sex and consent. And it was the most mortifying thing to have to do sex ed like that, like go to the doctor. <laughs> like It felt very clinical. But I, I think that that just kind of demonstrates how much education has been a part of my life and how much queer affirmation has been a part of my life. Um, my mom's best friend growing up, Adam, was um, a queer designer and he passed of AIDS in the 90s. And that kind of like my mom had this very strong imperative of I'm not going to allow my kid to feel like they need to be closeted. And that's, you know, almost the other side of the spectrum where you can't push your kid out of the closet, like be because be coming out isn't something that's mandatory. Um, there's a process of self-acceptance, self-understanding, um, self-definition, and whether or not somebody wants to share that with the rest of the world, even if that's your mom or your sister, like that's up to them. And so, it, it's that delicacy of kind of honoring bodily autonomy. So there were honestly no issues with me coming out as queer. In fact, when I came out to my mom, she corrected me a little bit. because I was like, mom, I'm a lesbian. And she was like, based on previous things that I know about you, perhaps we Google the word bisexual together. And I was like, okay, cool. It was not that diplomatic, um, but that's the version I'll tell you. And then uh, as far as my, my Islam, you know, when I converted to Islam in 2015, this was at the end of my college career essentially at Louisiana State University. And I think most parents, um, most families anticipate the wildness and the rebellion to happen in college, not right after college when you kind of feel like you're in the clear. Um, and so it was actually when I finished my studies that I converted to Islam, I took the Shahada at the Islamic Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And my mom was kind of like caught off guard. My dad was very comfortable because a lot of his friends had converted to Islam in the 60s and 70s, um, more so in the 70s and 80s even. And so he was very comfortable with it, you know, cool, whatever. Um, and my mom, on the other hand, had kind of been drinking the propaganda Kool-Aid around Islam and had this, you know, lots of fears around, what about your bodily autonomy? Um, hijab is oppressive. And, and it took a long time for us to evolve to a place of mutual understanding and respect. 
but it happened and it's been very important and, and necessary. And I think it's also important for people to understand that like, there's no dream coming out story, whether it's around you deciding a path that's different from your family, uh, whether it's you declaring parts about you that you know to be true, but others don't know whether or not they make it safe for you to express those things. It's gonna look different for everybody. Um, and I think that sometimes people expect one story, especially from queer Muslims or black queer folks or black Muslims, um, that there's one kind of perception. Um, being a, a black Muslim, for example, there's a perception that um, you're you know, part of the nation of Islam, which is a truth that many people do have, um, or you've been previously incarcerated. Um, and whenever that question comes up, I always make the joke that actually, no, I, I went to prison after I converted to Islam because there's such a stereotype around that. And that was due to um, activism organizing in Baton Rouge, Louisiana um, in 2016. And we're still suing the city of Baton Rouge. Um, and the interesting thing for me was at that time, I kind of came to the public scene because the arrest was so public and I started writing articles about it. and it first started at, as this impulse to correct the record because there would be things said like uh, the protesters were throwing bricks at the police. And it would be like, well, actually, no, I was there. Here's pictures. And it just kind of escalated from there to this is an opportunity for me to use that education piece to start to shift people's understandings or inshallah, try to add a new perspective that's not seen when police narratives are seen as the truth and the immutable truth. But I was also really tokenized. I think being a lighter skinned um, black convert to Islam evokes a lot of fetishization around figures that we have uh, throughout the civil rights movement, black power movements. Um, and then also myself like being hyper aware of passing for a lot of different like North African or Arab cultures. Like that also I think made me feel or kind of elevated me to the position of like being the golden child, like the new convert on the block until I came out in 2017. <laughs> and then suddenly I was getting uninvited to panels. Um, and I wanna be really clear here that it wasn't that I had fallen from grace. It was that the people who were tokenizing me didn't see me as a whole person anyway. And so when it came time for them to learn something that about me that had always been true, that they were just made privy to because I outed myself on Fox News on accident, which is a whole other story, um, those people decided to withdraw their support, but that support wasn't really authentic to begin with. And I'm honestly quite grateful that the people who were not in support of me got out of my space. I didn't choose for it to happen in the way that it did um, because you can't really choose for somebody to totally come from like fetishizing you and tokenizing you when it really feels like love and acceptance and then turn around and totally discard you because that humanization factor wasn't there. And so in hindsight, I can see that, but in the moment it did feel like rejection. It did feel very unfair, um, but the people who stayed, the people who I've come to know, the people in my life, those are the people that I hold on to. And that's what the element of chosen family is truly. And I think that part of the advocacy that I try to do today is about trying to convey to people that that is something we all deserve, period. We all deserve a loving, respectful community, regardless of whether or not who we are is at odds with what people perceive is correct or the right way to be. Um, because there's so many ways to exist. And there's like a tiny amount of things that are allowed within our society. I mean, think about cis normativity and heteronormativity. The idea that being straight is the only valid way to have a relationship and then being cisgender is the only valid way to exist. These constructs are so new relative to all of human history. And if you don't fit into that binary, then you're not valid. And that automatically creates so much diversity because you're creating what the normative is. And so few people fit into that. That's actually more unlikely if we look at the very many ways that people exist in love and whether or not we use terminology for that. And so I think that um, since that moment kind of of feeling that shift, I realized, hey, if I, because uh, for just, just really quickly, when I got arrested, I was in short shorts and a short sleeve shirt. And I was crying and I was sweaty and it was terrifying. And I was there in Baton Rouge with my partner, who's now my fiance, Akeem, and we were getting arrested uh, for what we loved. And we honestly didn't think we would make it. Um, and I think <laughs> to see people turn around and say, I can't believe she sat there and prayed half naked. And it's like, that's the takeaway. That really gives you the perspective that people aren't always looking for the righteous acts. They're looking for the performance of perfection. And that's not something any anyone can achieve. And so I'm in a place now where I do not pursue that. 
uh, it's still something that's very ingrained in me. And so uh, like, it's not every single day that I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm cool with not being perfect. Like sometimes I'm like, no, why am I not reaching this unattainable level? I'm really comfortable with who I am. And I'm also attempting to, inshallah, get comfortable with people feeling however they're going to feel about that and not wanting to be this perfect people pleaser who's universally liked because that's impossible. Sheesh, okay. Wow, mashallah. There's so many gems and what you have literally all that you had said. Um, when you were talking, what came to me was the miseducation of being black, Muslim and queer. <laughs> I was like the album cover here, right here. Um, talking about like how, yeah, that part about being black and Muslim, which yo, like uplifting that too. Um, I remember uh, I remember that time actually when you were first coming on the scene because I also like simultaneously was accidentally coming out in my community at uh, when the, uh, 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 the Portland shooting happened, Orlando shooting happened, and we did a and we did a protest, and that was like inadvertently came out on accident, and like or not like on accident, like at least publicly. And um, that around that time, I also like started following you, and that was like around the time where like it was just like bubble, bubble, yo, so I been following you for a minute, <laughs> lest we lest we forget. And so like, um, and when I fo had found you and followed you, I was like, yo, I thought I was literally the only Muslim queer person that had been out in my community, period, period. There's no- Cause that's how it's made to yet. feel. We are made to feel so isolated and so Absolutely. weird and strange right. and deviant. I mean, if we think about the word straight, for example, that came out the terminology in the 1930s, I believe. And it was specifically used, like if you look up straight in the dictionary, all the different definitions, in addition to being like geometrically straight means not deviant, normative, mm -hmm. normal, and then 25 different definitions later it says or heterosexual mm. so those things don't it, that's going to cause us to feel yeah. those ways and then you also have islam being ostracized blackness mm. feeling constantly ostracized i was just telling my friend here in london that i only mm. feel american when i'm not in america and then i start realizing oh no but it's like tony morrison said american means white and everyone else has to hyphenate mm. and when she said that it's just it's the way that we are meant made to feel Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think that those things are so, so complex and like, so frustrating, but they're also mm -hmm. so true because it, it just, it is how it is. Um, and it's not fair. <laughs> it <is. laughs> yeah, it is what it is. Like, yeah, it was me and my brother say that's what it is what it is. I, well, this is just like a pop-up side question, uh, that came out. What are your say, what were you saying? Cause I absolutely love, um, you know, when I get the opportunity to travel with my mom, um, I, I I definitely distinctly think about, yo, like my blackness, my identity feels so different when I'm not in America, it's wild. And so as like a black queer Muslim traveling in the world, like now reaching an international audience of people who love what you do, that love the things you talk about, you're clearly, even in this conversation, just dropping historical gems, which is like feeding. And I feel like I also can't wait to touch on like, the inter the intersectionality between and the relation your relationship between being a historian and, and Islam because so much of Islam is like history and storytelling like literally um uh, but like how in terms of like experiencing what that means for you here versus now like shredding out to an international audience like what has that experience been like it's been really interesting actually and um it's been so, oh, I have so many things to say. I haven't really had a space to talk about it. So this might dominate the rest of the conversation. I apologize, um, but you can cut me off. I think one of the interesting things is that um, there is such a desire within different spaces, particularly Euro-colonial spaces. And that's what we might describe as the Western world otherwise um, for importing people to speak up on issues that are happening at home. So, for example, I did a delegation trip with black for like you know Black Lives Matter activists, um, and uh, in Germany. And my recommendation to them was, don't import your Black Lives Matter activists. You have Black Germans who need to speak up on these things who've been organizing right here, but they're not in any of these rooms. Why is that? Of course, I broke the rules and brought in a bunch of folks from Black Lives Matter Berlin. Um, and so, uh, being here in London, one of the first talks that I did um, that 
like following getting arrested was for the Bob and Roberta um, Smith art installation educator um, that was about looking at protests for BBC and it was a BBC documentary. And when we came here, my partner and I, um, we were in a cab and just, you know, like a white working class guy was telling us about how much he is enamored with Black Lives Matter. And this is 2017. And that happens more commonly now, especially since the, you know, past racial awakening or whatever you want to call it in 2020. Um, but to have that then was so bizarre to me. And just to see people really admiring Black Lives Matter, but then simultaneously ignoring things like the disproportionately high rates of Black people who are incarcerated in the UK, um, ignoring the Windrush generation, people who literally spent their entire lives working for the betterment of the UK only to be um, deported in their old age because their documents got lost and sometimes uh, intentionally. And I really encourage anyone who's interested in that to look up the Windrush generation. Um, we also have looting of you know ancient artifacts that are in museums, but people don't wanna look at that. They wanna go, oh, look, it's so horrible in America. How are you getting on? Are you okay? Instead of, and how is my position here in the UK literally because of harms to other places. Like even when I talk about things like the public infrastructure here being so great, it's also at the expense of the exploitation of other countries in the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth isn't the Commonwealth. It's not, dis it's not distributed in a common manner. Um, but I find that even myself coming from the United States, I can come here and perhaps also my field, but speak about these things very dispassionately. Um, and I try to do that same thing when I talk about the United States and speak about it dispassionately and not get caught up in the propaganda and in the wanting to uphold something. But I'd even noticed myself saying, oh, in America, they, and I really have to say in America, we, because I'm also part of that system, regardless of whether or not I want that to be true. And so I think that the biggest thing for me, uh, whether we do this work internationally or domestically or whatever those things mean, whatever borders are, is to be honest with ourselves about our participation and not othering and distancing ourselves from those systems. Because the fact is that by virtue of me being an American and all those things that that means, especially even calling myself an American when that's a whole two continents and why are we the only ones that, that, with, that use that name? Is it even the thing to desire calling us that name when it is Turtle Island and these names are all Euro colonial inventions. It's like this ongoing conversation, um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, that means automatically having privilege in spaces, like even though I am a black queer Muslim who veils because I have an accent that's American, I'm immediately then, oh, you know, but then my British friends who are black, queer and Muslim come to the United States and they're treated differently than somebody else might be treated uh, without that marker of prestige um, of not being from here. And I've had conversations with people about who plays what roles in Hollywood um, and, and things of that nature, but it's not uniformly you know, wonderful. Like for example, when I go to France, which is deeply Islamophobic um, in ways that are just different than how the United States is Islamophobic, not uniquely. Uh, I think that's an important thing to say. I don't wear hijab because, you know, we're black and sometimes that's enough to go through. And, you know, in the Quran, there is discussions of, you know, Allah wanting us to protect ourselves by any means necessary and not subjecting ourselves to violence for this point of, you know, expressing our ego or our pride. And that connects to everything mm -hmm. from being closeted to not wearing a veil to just mm -hmm. getting by and surviving even mm. if it's not on your specific terms, because we have to live for that that other day. So that's what it's like traveling for me right now. Sheesh, ooh, and I definitely, and you talked about this a little bit actually, and uh, uh, I actually saw a queer, it was like a queer kids episode. I told you I did my research. Uh, you're talking about hijab and like how um, just the, how hijab is also within as well, which is definitely like affirming that. Um, and you're saying like, it no. very much is. <laughs> and even when I say that, I don't always, pre like I don't always recall that because right. when you have the physical reminder of that yeah. expression of faith, it's much easier to follow and keep in mind. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like this is a great story. I was in Vegas, I was doing a conference mm -hmm. and I had newly become sober. And so I was very high and mighty about that, which is like, mm -hmm. You know, if you're all high and mighty about doing a good deed, then it like, is it really for the right reasons, you know? But anyway, I was in there and there was, um, a hijabi and she was walking around and I was looking at her and she's like walking around in the slots 
mind you, if I'm looking at her walking around in the slots, I'm also walking around in the slots. But I'm thinking, I'm like, this girl's walking around in the hijab, in the bar, in the in the casino. What is she doing? I'm gonna tell God. And it's like, but Blair, you're also right there too. And so that like being honest with ourselves about how we contribute to those things, it's like one thing for me to write a piece about modesty culture and purity culture. But the fact is that there's a lot of participation even with the people who are de like denouncing it. And I think it is so healthy and so necessary to name these things um, because I think it helps other people see like too, like, oh, it's not gonna be like a light switch. It's this gradual process of mm -hmm. learning and not putting ourselves on a pedestal of performing Islam in the way that is most normative or most approved of, but instead doing the things that are you, you're doing for your soul because God calls you to do that. I mean, ah, come on now. <laughs> I know he was going to go to cook my vibes right now, but we, we here. We're having a halakha at this point. Um, <laughs> but yo, looking for performance a perfection of other people, like you named. I'm so glad that we like kind of like circle back um, just back there um, because looking for performance and perfection and performance of other people is something that's not only what we do to ourselves, that we do to other people, we also do to ourselves. Like recently I've been coming into understanding and also like had to come into a reawakening with my Islam in the sense that like when I grew growing up, I grew up Muslim. So my, my relationship to my Islam has been I feel like we all have a a revert moment um, when it comes to you know our journey with Islam, and so you know, there growing up, I felt like it was a lot of God sees you as, or you're supposed to see God as this all punishing, all whatever, all this, and coming back in, I was like, hold up, you know what's sustainable for me? The love. The love is sustainable. The no El Wadud is sustainable. And Nor is sustainable, you know, finding the words of the manifestations of God that feels relevant and not looking for perfection in people, but looking for perfection in him. Okay. Because <laughs> period. Because you can't achieve it otherwise. Like, I think that was the thing that I carried with me from being a Christian was not being Christ, but being like Christ, you know, like to use, you know, my my heritage of understanding that. And I think another thing was me trying to just kind of cold turkey switch the way I prayed. You know, I don't speak Arabic. I tried to pray in Arabic for such a long time. I pray in English because that's the language I communicate. God knows all languages. God created all languages. Um, and, and just doing the things that are right for you because that is how you do best. And I think that that's all we're trying to do is do our best. And at some point I had said, I think I posted on Instagram that I gave up on trying to please Muslims and I try to focus on pleasing Allah because I'm gonna lose, there's too many personalities. But I could talk to one entity every day and feel, you know, I feel truly Allah. that if you're in touch with yourself, you know when you're doing wrong and you know when you're doing right. And I think for myself, I know when I'm trying to justify bad behavior mm. and I know when I'm actually living the light, you know? And so those things were important to me and then also, I love gospel music. I'm not going to suddenly lose that part of myself. Yeah. Um, and I also had such anger with the faith of, mm -hmm. of Christianity that I had put, you know, this grass is greener in the other faith kind of perception into mm -hmm. Islam. And I was like, no, Islam isn't racist. Islam doesn't have problems. Mm -hmm. if, it's a, it's, if it's a system that human beings participate in, there's gonna be problems. And it's okay mm -hmm. to name those things. Even to me talking about hijab with my mother, um, I was so afraid to like actually name the fact that hijab is used for oppression, just like everything is used for mm. oppression. But I was so intent on not giving her that space to have her argument that I didn't even want to acknowledge these things. And that's honestly toxic because not confronting the things that are an issue does not make them go away. And we try to do that with racism. We try to do that with homophobia. Just don't talk about being queer. Just don't talk about queerness. But what we don't also say is stop being homophobic, but we can't mm -hmm. stop from participating in systems of oppression if we're not honest about how we are participating in the first place. Mm, yeah. There's like three things that I that really just hit me and I want to try to like articulate it as best as I can. <laughs> um, one, okay, so the first part, was um, I actually take I took a course with Brother Bilal out of you know Brother Bilal um, Butch Ware on Instagram. Listen, he be throwing down the classes, um, and I took a, a course called the African Quran, and so it 
he, he talked about, and you were talking about talking to God in the language that feels relevant to you. Um, and talking about like, you know, the prophet Idris and the, in the book of Idris and him coming down with, um, revelation and, and, and how the message has come down multiple, multiple times in different languages. And it wasn't just, you know, cause there's also that Arabic, like, Oh, because you're Arab. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, we have to name it. I think that the huge part of when I first converted was that for a lot of people, mm. I was North African or Arab passing. And there is that perception from outside of the Muslim community that proximity to Arabness is better. And there is that perception within the community. And it's not shameful to name it. What I feel is shameful is to ignore that and to gaslight people who do experience that violence. Um, but Islam is so diverse. And I think what's really beautiful is that despite these constructs uh, of oppression and of racism, Islam still continues to grow wherever you throw the, the seed and do it in so such an organic manner. The people who I know who are Muslim, and this is not to say it's a universal experience, mm. pursued it um, on their terms, at least in adulthood. Many mm. people who you know who were born into it, like I felt like I had to go to church because my parents drove me everywhere. But once I chose my, my faith, I really felt like it was on my terms because my peers, I would say, what does this surah mean? And they would say, I'm not gonna tell you, I want you to read it and I want you to come back to me and we will have a discussion. And that's mm -hmm. not how everyone comes into the faith, but right. I feel like that is such a beautiful way. And I feel like there's such a precedent within the Quran about that, but mm -hmm. it has to be relevant to you because like, you don't wanna copy somebody else's Islamic homework. You know, you don't wanna say, oh, uh, well, you said it was this interpretation. I guess that makes sense for me because it might not. And so when people come to me and they ask me things like, Blair, how can you do your nails? When some people believe that if you, uh, you know, don't have your nail bed, you know, showing then you can't really perform wudu. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you why I don't believe that. It's okay that we have different beliefs. Perhaps what you should do is go interrogate why you do believe that. Um, and that's okay if we come to a different understanding, but what's not okay is when we try to colonize each other in the way that we perform Islam and that we, you know, interact with God or not perform Islam the way we do Islam. Um, that's the problem. It's not the differences in belief. It's the domination of people saying what is not is not the correct way to do it. Mm. And that goes with queerness and blackness and, as well. And it, that go, and it, it all, it all connects um, just to like, we've been marinating in this. Um, and so just to like, with the wrap up, like there was, what came to me as you were saying that was taught was thinking about how like disagreement at least in, in, a, in an islamic sense and i'm rough translating is like a mercy like we're supposed to at like be diverse we're I supposed mean, to that means we're conscious if we're disagreeing right right can we talk about it um and so absolutely and so with that and coming to disagreement and being in in all of that and you talked about how you and your mom came into disagreements about your identity and like how you came to that and that there was miseducation. And you talk a lot about, about how you're a historian and, and what that means to you. And so my question is like, when you're coming into your strong sense of self, it's something that you said in a, in a fossils ad, it's like coming into your strong sense of self. How did you know now that, now that you're like in this place of an intersectional awakening, you're like, I'm black, I'm queer, I'm Muslim, I'm a historian how did you then find your role in the movement? Because it seems like you shifted it up a little bit a couple of times. You were like- I, I did. This is what happened. <laughs> so, okay. So I realized, um, oh, you're gonna like this one. Okay, I'll use the metaphor one. Um, okay, imagine activism as a potluck or as an orchestra, as Feminista John says, and you wanna bring something, okay? But say that you, you know, everybody wants to bring the best cake or the best mac and cheese, right? but not everybody has the best recipe or all the ingredients and that is okay. And so for me, what my like dream dish was, was to be a grassroots activist, was to disrupt the system, was to be extremely hands-on. I can no longer do that. I have PTSD from being arrested. And the other problem is that there's such miseducation about the trauma that goes into this and the idea that everyone has to be a martyr. And that's, you know, not, that's not factual we deserve to live in the world that we're trying to create. And that means also having a sustainable mindset about how we do that work. Um, and so I, it got to the point where I just couldn't go to pro, I couldn't do the thing. I kept trying to make that recipe and it kept failing. And it's not because of me, it was because I was trying to put my energy into the wrong vehicle. And I studied to be a historian. I worked with Miss Sadie Roberts Joseph. 
Um, she completely changed my life and she taught me that it doesn't matter how big the concept is or how many degrees you have. If you can't explain it to everyday people, it doesn't mean anything because it is just more violence. It is just more gatekeeping. It is just more denial of education and that's a human right. And um, those things really impacted me. And as I was trying to pursue this vision of who I wanted to be, but also who I felt like I was expected to be, I was shirking my responsibility to, to be who I was meant to be. And so I feel very talented at making really advanced concepts very digestible and attainable. And I do it to Smarter in Seconds and my series Get Smarter with Blair Imani and my book um, Read This to Get Smarter, which comes out in October. And there could be a version of me where I'm still trying to pursue my ideal instead of doing what I'm, what really fulfills me and what sits with my soul and sustains me. And so I, I just realized that so many times in my life I had said things like um, Dr. Terry Roberts says, you know, find out what you enjoy doing and what you're good at and do it well and do it for justice. But just because we are not doing the grassroots fight does not mean that we are not fighting. And it has to be very specific here because there's perceptions of things like, oh, you can't be an influencer and be ethical. Not if you're doing it in the capitalistic manner, not if you're saying, oh, well, there's no ethical conception in capitalism, oh, well. Not if you're doing the bare minimum with your own work and exhausting yourself and paying no one and not redistributing funds or investing in other people so that they can advance themselves. But if you're not doing those things, you're practicing ujama, you know, uh, Africana socialism, cooperative economics, and really investing in people and work, then you can do those ethical things. But not all that work happens externally. And so that shift completely happened around 2018. And I worked really intently for people to understand me, not as an activist and kind of this nebulous term that means so many different things to so many different people, but as a historian, as an educator, because that is what I do. And I feel like that's where I'm better suited. And that's what will keep me whole to be able to live in that world that I'm trying to create. Sheesh, okay. I felt that deep because I also used to be a grassroots. I would say used to be because I still practice it in a way that feels affirming to me. Um, I was like heavy into like union organizing and that, and in and, and the hopes that it would like impact my community, bring jobs and all these different things. But there was like this toxic energy of like, if you're not at every meeting, if you're not out in the street laying your life on the line. If you're not broken down sobbing, right. you know, like, right. and it's not, it's not right. because it's the ideal of it. It's totally what we, like um, my friend, Jamia Wilson, her mother would say, everybody wants to be Angela Davis, but everybody wants to be their image of Angela Davis. They're not consulting Angela Davis on what to do. They're trying to do what the, the image, you know, it's like wish fulfillment. Um, and the thing is, in pursuit of maybe you have a role model, right? But you shouldn't be pursuing that role model to be them. Maybe you find yourself through them. And that's the really important thing is to understand that sometimes we are our own role models. We might be the first person to do something. But honestly, as a historian, I think the biggest thing, and before we go into questions is, I think that the idea of being the first this to do that and the first this to whatever can be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can be really affirming and exciting, but on the other hand, it can make us feel like, well, because nobody has been here before that there never was somebody, particularly when we talk about queerness. Because we don't know every queer ancestor, because the way that we discuss queerness is so different than how it was discussed previously. And that's okay, because language evolves. And so there are queer ancestors who we need to honor, not on our understandings, but on their terms. Folks like Lorreen Hansberry, folks like James Baldwin, folks like Little Richard, folks like, you know, just the unnamed folks who existed, Georgia Black, who existed in their queerness and their wholeness and didn't describe themselves in the same ways that we do, but we're still there. And that gives me a sense of resoluteness that, yes, I'm sure there are people who were activists and did the grassroots work and then became educators and historians. Um, and if not, that's okay. But I can also sit, take comfort in the fact that I'm not blazing a trail because that's colonizing. I'm contributing to the sustainability of the space and trying to create that world of openness. But I'm not having to be a trailblazer because sometimes all we need to leave behind is footsteps, not a carved path through a natural landscape. I'm contributing, I'm not trailblazing, I'm contributing to a long lineage. And I feel like 
I've had this really great deep conversation about queer activism. One of my friends actually was like, I did not know that Angela Davis was queer. And I was like, wait, hold on a second. Um, and it, it really made me sit and reflect to think about how often we see queer folks, queer black folks leading at the forefront for folks who nine, not nine times out of 10, but for folks who so heavily like are like, ah, da, 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 but are still fighting for everybody's healthcare rights, are fighting for everybody's human rights. And I think that this is where that kind of intersectional piece as from all, from all that we've been talking about, talking about how our intersectional identities and helping us under, and us knowing ourselves, us identifying ourselves and having a strong sense of self orients our activism so that we're able to fight, or if we want to, when we choose that and whatever that looks like, we're able to show up for all of our, all the intersectional parts of what human Cause rights that's the thing. means. Cause many of us don't choose to become activists one day. I mean, for me, mm. it just felt like this constant discomfort. It wasn't, you know, like Elle Woods waking up and deciding to go to law school. You know, it was like waking and just just not being able to survive otherwise. Um, for example, one of the protests that we organized in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, with my my colleague, my co-organizers, Shemeika Shoemake and Zandeshe um, Brown, was a protest called Suspect Vague. And the police at you know Louisiana State University had sent out a suspect description that was basically black man in a hoodie, be on the lookout to a city that's majority black and it's cold outside. And that was the first time I had like gone on, you know, the student news, like you can find my old little videos probably. And I look, I'm trying to stick to my talking points and get across and it's so funny now because I speak extemporaneously all the time, but mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I had to be that spokesperson uh, because other folks were afraid to go on the news. <laughs> and I was going to school with the, the person who was putting people on the segment, like it really worked out, but it wasn't that I had just jumped into it. It was because no, that's literally a dangerous situation for me and my peers to be in. What can I do about it? Or learning about um, my friend going to conversion therapy or being forced into conversion therapy because he came out to his parents mm -hmm. in Louisiana. And it's not to say that that oppression didn't exist in California, but being so attuned to that in college where I really feel like the training wheels are off, like you can really try uh, and push things. I felt like I couldn't just sit still. And it was that impetus, that impulse to act, not something where I, I literally could not continue living and be unaware of what was going on or, or and be aware of what was going on and then do nothing about it. It was like, I have to do this. And so I think when people are marginalized away from this way that we describe humanity since the enlightenment era of white European cisgender straight men, you have to act because you won't be able to survive otherwise. Mm. <laughs> bars <laughs> okay mm. all of that absolutely i'm just like yes <laughs> Ooh, looks like you have a question. A lot. yeah we got a question i talk a lot but you have me speechless so our first question from the audience um is what are some ways folks particularly young folks can contribute to an ecosystem instead of a trail blazing a trail Ooh. And it's, it's interesting because I think in my books before I've described like the leaders as trailblazers, but I really feel like this is the shift that I have to have in my, the way I describe my language or describe things is that, um, oh, one second, let's see. Okay, I'm drawing, all right. My, my, my laptop's going to die in just a few minutes. So hopefully it'll be okay. Um, so I think that what's important is that when we think of blazing a trail, what that means is kind of having a reckless abandon of getting to the forefront of, of the next coast, no matter what leaving behind whatever debris and chaos happens. Things like shattering a glass ceiling and not thinking about where that glass is going to fall as my friend Nala Simone had said. It really is about thinking about the whole comprehensive ecosystem. You will step on a lot of toes if you're intent on being the first one to do something or the loudest one or the most seen person. And I've been in that position as well. It was very seductive to be you know, build as the queer Muslim and not be conscious about how I was erasing queer Muslim elders or queer folks who um, couldn't come out and taking up this space in a way that was really satisfying to me, but really detrimental to the space. And it might be exciting to be the first one to come down a path, but literally think about things like the erosion of like Antarctica and the Mount Everest, like 
the way that humans can be so detrimental to a space instead of honoring the fact that we're part of this ecosystem. And so I think that's a necessary thing. It requires a little bit of a history lesson, which I can always help with because I'm a historian, really thinking about what is the context of the space that I'm coming into? How can I be there to, to learn and teach if, if called to teach and be innovative and creative and not colonistic in, in the way that we're doing the work because I've been I've been that person like oh well this hasn't gotten changed yet why hasn't it gotten changed I guess nobody else tried it instead of thinking what are the strategies that we've tried and how can I use my energy and my excitement to fortify the initiatives instead of thinking hmm if I can't if it hasn't gotten done without me I guess I can show up and fix it immediately and it's not to say that's the specific arrogance that people are coming into spaces with but it is to say that I've been there before and I know that a lot of young people come to that space as well. And so I think from, from speaking from experience that it just takes that step back to go, okay, just because I'm newer doesn't mean I'm smarter. Doesn't mean I don't have any less to contribute, but it means how can I innovate with people and not reinvent the wheel so that way we can get farther together. And that, e uh, and that ecosystem of self too, like not trail trying to trailblaze through yourself and like whether it be martyring or sacrificing or like ripping or pulling apart, but also like how, how what does that look like to contribute to the self ecosystem? I know that there are, uh, I was excited also to do this, to be, be a moderator and be in this space with you because I know there's a lot of queer young people that hit me up that I talk to that are queer and Muslim and all this other stuff. And I, I can imagine that you have so many, a wealth of like amazing young people who love what you do and, and all that you do. And so I would even have a follow-up question in, in terms of like that ecosystem of self, like how, you know, what advice you have for young people in contributing to the ecosystem of, them, of themselves and particularly in the, in the lens of interest young people who I feel like now are identifying this intersectionality like at earlier than I was identifying it. I was like, bruh, and getting it together. And so, yeah, that, that, is, that is my question. <laughs> hey, and it's just me and you. So we're gonna wait for, um, you know, Blair to pop back up. But in the meantime, um, just to marinate on on that, on that piece, um, and even say a little bit about my experience. Um, there we go. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we're you back. We're me. back. I got. We're flowing. I got the team to grab the charger. Um, <laughs> you get to be whole. Of self is really necessary because what often happens is we discover or become comfortable with articulating an element of ourselves and we kind of discard everything else and i think that happened with me like i don't think at a certain point i was ever like closeted in a way that i'm comfortable with like admitting probably <laughs> but there were definitely moments where i was more comfortable with my queerness and times where i wasn't um and i think when i converted to islam i had this struggle of saying that i'm queer and it wasn't because i was believing this myth of Islam being uniquely homophobic, a myth that I reject wholeheartedly from experience, having been a Christian as well, um, but feeling like it was too much of me, feeling like I had to do everything in my, you know, everything in my life by 25 or I would be, you know, useless. And a lot of it comes from ageism. You know, I think that it's really important to name that these things aren't just miseducation, but intentional education in a way that's misdirected. Um, you know, like really thinking about like misdirection as, as part of what this, this thing is. And so I think pouring into ourselves is necessary, but I really believed like if I took a nap instead of organizing a protest, I was, you know, harming, the, I was committing oppression. And the fact is that it has to be a shift in mindset from being perfect, right. To understanding, Hey, how can I contribute to the space? How can I do that in a way where I'm not feeling like I have to be the savior of everyone because that's detrimental to ourselves and to other people. Um, I see it a lot with student organizers and I'm sure you've seen it as well where there's one person who's really dynamic and then they leave the school and then a lot of things kind of get stagnant because I don't even know what their strategy was. What were their plans? Were they gonna take like a succession plan? Um, or you have the other version where you, there is a succession plan but it's not democratically decided upon. It's kind of nepotism and that makes resentment in the space. And 
it just requires so much honesty with ourselves. And I think that there's also the ageism of expecting young people not to be able to grasp those things. But if they're not taught, then it will never be grasped. And so those things have to be really important. And those ugly conversations too, of how traumatic it is to get arrested. And yes, it's beautiful and freedom fighting is wonderful, but honestly, it's hard for me to hear sirens now. Like I have PTSD. That's violence from the state that is gonna be inflicted on me my whole life. And so um, we have to think about these things for, you know, forewarned is forearmed. Um, and and really be compassionate with ourselves and not feel like, oh, my body is sensitive, that's a bad thing, but my body is extremely attuned to my circumstances and the context and the things that I need, as Dr. Shea Kilmick-Lean says, um, and honoring that and supporting that. Um, I'm thirsty, I must drink water because I deserve to be cared for, I deserve to be whole in this space as well. And it's that part right there that we lose so much. And that's something that I personally am struggling with is like, yo, uh, drink water and lay down sometimes because you be doing the most. And I think that what what's coming up for me, if you hear my baby niece crying in the background, we're going to exist in wholeness. <laughs> my, my beautiful baby niece. And what what's like feeling me as we coming into these last couple minutes, which <laughs> tear, tear, I'm feeling the tears, um, is the knowing of body yourself, what your body needs, what your spiritual self needs and what your emotional self needs and, and what that looks like and feels like. Um, and so, yeah, that's feeling very relevant for me what, from all that you're saying. And so as we wrap up in our last couple minutes, this is a day of action. We've gone through so much and I feel like we could keep talking uh, for hours more about all, you know, all that we've that we've discussed. Um, but now how at knowing all these things as we carry all these things and all this knowledge and all the gems that you that you put down, Juneteenth vibes coming, all the all yes. the different things. How are how are we taking action? How can we show up? How can we show up? So I think the most important thing with Juneteenth is to understand the origins of it. And I'll do my best a little smarter in seconds here at the end. I wrote a little script about it as well because I'll be filming that. Um, it's basically to understand that, you know, Lincoln wasn't this benevolent man who wanted to end slavery because he was, he sympathized. It was a military strategy. He said very clearly if he could keep slavery and join and, you know, preserve the union, he'd do it. And if he had to get rid of slavery and preserve the union, he'd do it. Um, and I have a smarter and second son about how, how he was racist and literally he was. Um, but the thing with Juneteenth is that the Emancipation Proclamation was a military strategy to destabilize the Confederacy. And then Abraham Lincoln signed in 1862 and it applied in 1863, the, um, the Emancipation Proclamation only to abolish slavery in the states that had already decided that they didn't care about what the US had to say. They had defected, they had seceded. And then we have Lincoln saying, hey, in those states, get rid of slavery. And there were still states that that didn't apply to. So there were states within the union where slavery was still going on um, to keep the economies going because it became, it was a capitalistic thing. It was a power thing. Um, and so when Juneteenth came, it wasn't that black people were freed. It was that federal troops had finally arrived in Galveston, Texas. But we had been saving ourselves. I think that narrative has to be really shifted and understood. I would spend your Juneteenth learning about these things, learning about the you know Afro-Mexican folks who you know basically fled from Texas to survive, not just to Canada, but to Mexico, to anywhere where refuge was safe, to the Caribbean, to get free. Um, because when we talk about enslavement, we have to remember that no one is a slave. People are enslaved. Enslavement is the condition that humans force onto each other. And so those are the things that must be understood. And Juneteenth, you know, it can be a time of jubilation. It can be a time of celebration. It can be a time of remembrance. I'm not going to ever tell a Black person how to celebrate it. But I think for every person who's not Black, who doesn't have that legacy of, you know, surviving anti-Blackness, it is a time of remembrance, understanding. Um, and it doesn't have to be a time where you post a grayscale image of people in Texas, but it should be a time where you redistribute your resources that are the product of exploitation of black people because that did not end with slavery. For example, uh, prison labor, prison laborers, incarcerated people uh, are only allowed by the Bureau of Prisons to make $1.15 per hour. Um, and those people are the ones who are making your organic cotton teas. So take this time to learn about the exploitation that you are still benefiting from because it is there, I promise. 
Um, and I benefit from this as well. It's not a one-sided thing. Um, and so those are the imperatives for this Juneteenth week. I also wanna speak up on um, Miss Sadie Roberts Joseph, my mentor who uh, would organize the Juneteenth celebrations in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Just become attuned to the people who were talking about Juneteenth before 2020, before 2019, um, and honor that truth, honor yourself in that truth, and be honest about how you, de you, you show up in that truth, whether or not you are a, a descendant of enslaved people, of, in, in a descendant of African peoples, because we all participate in this world, whether we benefit from these systems of oppression or are harmed by them. And the more we can become attuned to that, the more we'll get free. And on that note, yo, the more we get in tune to that, the more we get free. Thank you incredibly so much, Blair Imani, for words cannot describe, mashallah, your words are so powerful and impactful. And I'm so excited for people to to absorb them, for them to look back on this and have for, for some time. I wanna give you an opportunity to let people know where they can find you. I know you have a new book coming out, which you already know, I'm there. I'm there, I'm present. Are Next book like, party, yes. Yes, um, right, well, well, I wanna thank you so much, Salwa. You absolutely crushed it. This is delightful. I'm gonna start recommending you to interview me for other stuff because this is really okay. great and I really appreciate how prepared you are. Thank you so much to folks who prepared this event, to the New Haven Pride Center for organizing this. You can find me on Instagram at Blair Imani and on YouTube and on TikTok. Um, I have a series called Smarter in Seconds. I'll be doing one on Juneteenth, which will be coming out this week. And um, you're just, you know, I'm your one, you know, not one stop shop because you should not be learning from one person ever. That's dangerous. Um, but I'm definitely part of your journey to, to getting smarter and becoming more um, compassionate. And Salwa, please tell, tell us where we can find you as well, oh. your artistic genius. Ah, mashallah. Um, so thank you so much for Pride Center, for Arts and Ideas, um, and, and just everybody involved. You can find me. I just changed my Instagram name to Selua Sweet Melodies. Trying to get on brand a little bit more. It used to be a little different, um, but now it's that. And yeah, I'm an artivist. I'm an activist. Um, and I just love making really dope art and also being in spaces of dope art and activism and, and where that lives and thrives. So alhamdulillah. Um, I'm going to end us off. So that's me. And I want to end us off with um, Surah Al-Fatiha and also just like amazing many blessings um, on Blair and your journey. And it's so beautiful, alhamdulillah, to see you now hitting this international audience. Um, <laughs> your your road is surely blessed, blessed alhamdulillah. So thank you. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil <laughs> Ashe, Ashe, thank you both for that. I was over here getting my Black liberation and Black joy on. Thank you so much, Blair. Um, something that you said really stuck with me and something that as an organizer in this space, this very white space of Connecticut, is like you can have all the tools, you can have 50 million degrees, you can know everything, but if you cannot get it, to the community, to the hood. Like I like to say, if the hood can't absorb it, then the hood won't absorb it. And that's who we need um, to further and expand this movement. Like we all have a space and a place on the front lines. Um, and so thank you. Uh, we're definitely gonna be making sure that we add your books to the New Haven Pride Center's library. We have an extensive library and um, it's really important to understand history so we don't keep repeating the same mistakes that we um, seem to be falling victim to in the field of organizing. Um, and, you know, you can be an organizer and activist in so many things. So I, I wouldn't say you're not an activist anymore. I would say that Blair, like education is activating. Um, and so thank you for that. Thank you for being in this space. Like evolution is a great thing. And that's what I heard in this space. And so thank you. Um, we want to thank everyone else in the audience for joining us for today's program. Um, there is, we're going to be closing out with our next program, which is a um, 
a open mic titled Power of the Spoken Word. Um, please join us. You can um, find us live on Facebook, um, on the New Haven Pride Center's page. If you follow me, I'll be sharing it in a second. Um, and as well as the New Haven Arts and Ideas page as well. Please join us in, in closing out the night with joy. Again, we want to thank all our sponsors, but we really want to thank um, the the International Festival of Arts and Ideas for making sure that Blair is here and Salwa Thank is you. here. Um, and we hope that um, you stay in touch, Blair. Salwa. Oh, absolutely. Salwa, you know, 